monthly presentation by Clive and Cece Pinnock of the Bird of the Month, and I'm looking forward to it. Clive and Cece, take it away. Uh, you, can, you can share your screen. I'll stop sharing mine. Just a second, Scott. Just a second. Can't hear you. Sorry. I'm sorry, we oh. Are we, are we almost there? I'm trying to, Scott, give me just a second. Sure, sure. Clive, in the interim, if you want to talk about condors, we'd love to hear more about them. <laughs> well, yeah, and regarding that, I was quite privileged in working with uh, several of the biologists uh, that uh, were a part of that project. Uh, when I worked as uh, at Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, we worked with uh, Arizona Department of uh, Wildlife Resources, as well as the Utah uh, Department of Wildlife Resources. And uh, one of several projects we worked on, um, in addition to bighorn sheep and others, was the reintroduction of the condor to our area. And uh, it was wonderful. We uh, actually had the um, birds in captivity, uh, feeding, caring for them, and uh, generally uh, setting up areas where they would eventually be released and held the birds there for several weeks so they could actually uh, become acclimated to the region. Um, once they... Uh, surpassed the uh, protocol that was established for them. Then we actually released the birds. Of course, they had the wing tags, they had telemetry, all that information on them so that they could be tracked. So it was uh, pretty amazing to be a part of all of that. And I think we're pretty close to getting this done. We apologize for all this. Everything is set up and just when you gave us the word, Scott, it, <laughs> things went a little awry. So. That's happened to me, no need to apologize. I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we have over 100 people, by the way, at our meeting. This is our largest attendance by far. And again, that's because we've expanded our account. So I see Clive has his screen up. I will mute myself. Clive, take it away. All righty. Well, okay. Uh, welcome to our Bird of the Month series for the month of May. Um, the 2021 Bird of the Month series continues to focus on North American species requested by you, our Audubon members. Uh, um, each month, information on the featured species will cover as usual, the description of the bird, the range, the habitat, food, and reproduction. Um, our primary focus this month is the Swainson's thrush. And we wanna again, thank Chuck Ignite for uh, sending in his request. Um, we've had uh, two or three 
from Chuck already. And uh, we're really uh, excited that he's chosen the ones that he has. Um, this beautiful little denizen of the uh, um, woodland areas uh, is generally more heard than seen. It's uh, um, uh, cryptic coloration helps to blend it in in the moist woodlands that it tends to prefer. Uh, if you notice here, the bird has the buffy white eye ring uh, spots on the breast area. And um, uh, the bird, what enhances its ability to hide and blend in so well is that even its voice has ventriloquial properties, meaning that they have the ability to uh, um, sort of throw their voice, so to speak, as a ventriloquist would, so that it makes it very, very difficult to see them. Um, the, uh, the Swainson's thrush that breeds in the Pacific states are sometimes called a russet back thrush. Uh, their backs are sort of rusty in color compared to uh, the olive back thrush, which is a subspecies of the Swainson's thrush as well. Um, these birds, uh, the russet backs, again, uh, tend to inhabit the Pacific states, whereas the more widespread Eastern and Northern form uh, inhabit the Cascade Sierra Nevada uh, area. Um, uh, here's a typical range map that shows these birds uh, where they nest. They generally uh, inhabit um, mixed deciduous and coniferous woodlands in the far north and mountainous regions. And they uh, tend to focus on areas that have very extensive leafy undergrowth. Um, outside of the breeding season, they extend quite a, a bit throughout North America and uh, tend to focus on typical woodland habitats that they would focus on while they are breeding. You can see uh, the yellow passage migrant where they, uh, these birds extend quite a bit throughout the United States. And uh, um, during migration is our best chance of, uh, of seeing them. Um, the birds uh, are predominantly insect and fruit eaters, unlike other uh, members of the uh, thrush family that focus most of their feeding activities on the ground. These guys tend to be a little bit more arboreal in their foraging um, uh, practices in that they will uh, tend to go to the trees as well, foraging for insects among the uh, pine needles and um, coniferous needles, as well as broad-leaved uh, uh, plants. They will focus quite a bit on uh, fruits and berries during the mid to late summer and fall periods uh, when those are made more available to them. But during spring and early summer, when they're nesting, they focus quite a bit on insects. And that is generally made up of ants, flies, beetles, uh, caterpillars quite a bit, and a variety of um, other arthropods, including uh, spiders as well. Um, these birds will uh, spend quite a bit of time on the ground uh, foraging for some of these insects. And uh, they have a variety of techniques that they use in capturing these insects. It, like other uh, thrushes, they will uh, rummage through the leaf litter or perch above the leaf litter, uh, scoping it for insects and then darting out to get them on the ground. But they also have a habit of pretending to be fly catchers where they'll dart out in midair and capture insects that way as well. Um, they, uh, during the breeding season, will inhabit coniferous and deciduous uh, forests. And uh, as those uh, photographs in the lower uh, slides show uh, the type of dense habitat that these birds will frequent, again, making it very, very difficult to spot them. Um, once breeding ensues in the spring, males actually uh, establish their territories using song and uh, they, these songs will function to, um, as I mentioned, mentioned uh, as I mentioned, to establish the territory, but also to attract receptive females. Uh, once a female enters that territory, she's pursued by the male, typically 
um, in flight. And then uh, once she uh, decides to respond to the male, uh, the chasing uh, slows and they will start spending time foraging for food together. Uh, nesting um, takes place where the female actually uh, builds the nest, usually over a four day period. Uh, the male does not assist in this, but he spends most of his time protecting the habitat from encroaching males. Uh, the uh, nest is built, as I mentioned, by the female, and uh, she uses a variety of material that are made available to her in the habitat, things like twigs, grasses, mosses, lichens, things of that sort, the barks of trees, and then for the inner lining, uh, animal fur and hair, uh, other soft materials. Uh, three to five eggs are laid, generally four uh, is the average. Uh, and these eggs are bluish green in color with uh, dark brown blotches at the larger end of the eggs. Uh, 10 to 14 days are the, is the incubation period. And again, that incubation is done solely by the female. Now, once the eggs do hatch, uh, the male does join the female in feeding and caring for the chicks. At hatching, the chicks are uh, naked, uh, blind, and uh, they are covered with a little bit of down, but um, they, uh, they're unlike the waterfowl and several other uh, precocial species that we've talked about in the past, these young are completely helpless and rely totally on the adults to care for them. The young generally fledge uh, uh, the nest in about 10 to 14 days as well. And uh, the uh, adult birds will head out on migration south, leaving the young to uh, find their way afterwards, which they're more than capable of doing. Um, uh, that's just a, a quick wrap up. I tried to make it fast because of the delay in um, getting going on this. We do have at the bottom of this slide though, uh, for those who would like to request birds for uh, throughout next year, um, the uh, pinnock, B-O-M at gmail.com. Again, pinnock, B-O-M, bird of the month at gmail.com. And, and any requests like Scott for you, the condor, um, please go ahead and send your requests there and we'll be sure to uh, add those to our list. Scott, if there are any questions, we will be more than happy to uh, uh, do our best to answer them. Uh, so um, we have two questions so far. And if you have more questions, if anyone has another question, uh, please put it in the chat area and we will be happy to ask Clive. So our first question is from uh, Kristen Murtaugh. Uh, do all thrushes have that ventriloquist ability? Yes, they do, as a matter of fact. Um, and it's, uh, as far as um, I can see, it's more a survival strategy or it adds to the overall survival strategy of the birds. Uh, these thrushes are very cryptic in color. As you can see, if you look in your field guides, wood thrushes, veeries, um, uh, the, um, the species that we're looking at, Swainson's and the other thrush members of the family are generally cryptic in color. Uh, the ventriloquial properties of their songs blends in perfectly because it uh, makes it difficult to see the bird, uh, but, um, and it also makes it difficult to, to locate the bird as far as where the song is being produced as well. So yes, they do all have that ventriloquial ability. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up uh, on that. Uh, are, are the songs of the Swainson's thrush as beautiful as the wood thrush and the uh, hermit thrush? Yes, they are. They're very flute-like in nature and um, uh, just absolutely beautiful to listen to. And um, again, they, they do use, what's interesting is, and I mentioned it in the PowerPoint presentation, they use these songs to uh, establish territories uh, the males do, but they will communicate um, with uh, females uh, as far as where they are and uh, that, that type of information as well. 
Uh, and next question uh, from Kay Gates. Uh, do all thrushes have that, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm getting the questions mixed up here uh, one more time. Oh, are thrushes and thrashers closely related? Kay Gates wants to know. Uh, I believe they are. Um, there's, there's work being done um, or, or there has been work done on the DNAs of these birds to determine just how closely. If you look at the both families, there are quite a few similarities, uh, but there are also distinctions as well. So they are, are separated um, and established as separate groups. But again, there are quite a few similarities. Yeah, um, I know that uh, thrashers are wonderful singers as well. Yes. Uh, and we have another question. Is there any physical difference between the male and the female of the swings and thrush? Not, not to my knowledge. They, uh, they uh, don't display any physical differences. Um, the only differences in the birds are the regional differences that I mentioned earlier. Those that are on the, in the Pacific states uh, are slightly different, more rusty in color on the, the backs of the birds as opposed to those that are east of the Sierra Nevada uh, areas and extending uh, eastward. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I just have one quick question. Can you tell us anything about, I, I assume it's, I don't know if it's a Mr. or Ms. Or Ms. Swain, Swainson, but can you tell us any, any more about who some of these birds, you know, like the hawks also are, are named after? Do you know anything about Swainson? No, unfortunately I do not. I know several species of birds, the Swainson's hawk and, and several others were named. And I'm pretty sure it is uh, because of the individual, I, but that information I am sure can be uh, um, researched on the internet. Well, I will look that up. Thank you so much, Clive, for another wonderful presentation. I can't wait till next month and I will be putting in my bird of the month request and requesting the California condor, which you'll probably get to in about a year based on all the requests that you already have. <laughs> so remember, if you want to request a bird from Clive, please contact him, let him know what bird you request. If you did not get the address down, you can contact me at info at audubonneverglades.org and I will relay your request to Clive and I'm sure he will be happy to, uh, at some point when he can, we'll get to that bird. All, All right, right. Uh, we have our, let me just share my screen real quickly again. Um, So we have our featured, is it showing? Okay, that should not be there. Okay, uh, whoops, too late. Okay, uh, our featured program tonight, and I'd like to introduce uh, Marianne Gable, who is one of our uh, new board members that was elected last month. And Marianne is also co-chairing our programs now, and she will be introducing our featured program speaker tonight, Richard Morud. Marianne, take it away. All right. Good evening, everybody. So let's start 40 years ago in 1981, and Richard established Mesozoic Landscapes Incorporated, specifically to research, grow, and promote plants native to South Florida. He is active in plant propagation, consulting, restoration, landscape design, writing, and much, much more. You can find an excellent example of his native and restorative landscaping. Um, that's the Hypoluxo hammock. And this coastal hammock uh, was dedicated as a park on March 9th, 1996, and is easily viewed on the south side grounds of the Hypoluxo town hall. Excuse me. Among his many published writings, he is co-author of Zurich Landscaping with Florida Native Plants. This is a guide to using native plant communities as the basis for environmentally sound landscape design. It was first published in 1991 
It's still in print and widely used, and you can go find a copy if you don't have one. <laughs> Richard is a charter member of the local chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. He served two years as president, edited the newsletter for more than a decade, and worked on campaigns to secure funds for the purchase and protection of natural areas. In 1990, while conservation chair at FNPS, he was appointed to the Endangered Plant Advisory Council under the Florida Commissioner of Agriculture. He continues to this day to serve on the council and has chaired the group since his initial appointment. Richard is also a charter member of the Association of Florida Native Nurseries. And in 1995, he was appointed to the Natural Areas Management Advisory Committee. He served as chairman for four years and continues to serve on the committee to this day. I think you'd call him a long-termer. So we're lucky to have someone so dedicated to our native plant communities. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's presenter, Richard Moirud. Thank you. So we should go right to the slideshow, I think. Yep, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm just gonna open it up. Okay. Okay. The um, slides are pretty much self-explanatory, but I'll walk through them with you. Uh, we have all driven past uh, this property, six islands, just south of the Southern Boulevard Causeway in the middle of Lake Worth Lagoon. And as far as I remember, driving by it, I've heard people say that's a bird sanctuary, period. No one goes in, leave it alone. No one knows what's going on. It's a bunch of mangroves. Well, things have changed. And um, let's go through the history of this. And uh, I'll talk a little of my uh, involvement with this. But um, it is a property that is unique in Palm Beach County, spe specifically in Palm Beach, the town of because it is within the town jurisdiction. Next. For those of you who don't know Lake Worth Lagoon, it's uh, 21 miles long and about a half mile wide. It's a natural lake or lagoon. Historically, it was freshwater. Storms would breach the uh, barrier island, turn it salty for a bit, and then all of the freshwater inland kept pushing, pushing, and kept it mostly fresh water until pioneers arrived in the mid 18, uh, 1800s. There are a number of natural islands within the lagoon. The one you all know, uh, obviously, is Hypoluxo Island. That is a natural large island, mostly developed. The Peanut Island is an artifact of dredging the Lake Worth Lagoon, which started in uh, the dredging was done in the late 1800s. Little Mayan Island or Mayan Island are natural. And some of the other islands, including all the Bingham Islands, are natural islands, not spoil. Ibis Isle and Everglades Isle were mangroves that were filled, covered with soil to put houses. So they were more or less natural. Next. The Audubon Islands are just south of the Southern Boulevard Causeway. <clears throat> and as I say, it includes six discrete islands. They were listed here by the Palm Beach County Erm, Fisherman's Island and Hunters and John's Island are owned by, I think they're owned by Audubon and leased to the town of Palm Beach or vice versa. In any case, they're not uh, private. The Bingham Islands have always been private and consist of these six islands south of um, the inlet of the uh, causeway. One of them was called Government Lot C. They were all peculiar, they have peculiar histories. Next. 
very good aerial shot. You can't see this from the road, but you can see one large island, a smaller linear island, and then a channel cut through one major island. That channel was cut, I think, in the 1880s. Amazing what they could do with their equipment. Next. The shot seeing, showing the Southern Boulevard Causeway in the foreground. And right now there's a lot of construction activity because the bridges are being replaced. So it doesn't look like that quite today. You can see a lagoon between the two islands. It's a very, very serene spot and birds find that most pleasing. There is no access to this island. These are private. There are signs posted, no landing. And it has become, I think, a, uh, a really nice resting spot for migratory birds. And we have local shorebirds. I don't know much about the nesting. I haven't observed a lot. And we will depend on our birders to help over the years see what's going on. Next. So Palm Beach County Erm got involved in this because they have done so much other excellent work in the lagoon and they saw these as a, a potential project. So they did some initial uh, surveying and some mapping and found in the middle of the largest island toward the south end, a circular patch, which is marked hammock or uh, high ground. And as far as I can tell, I'm still trying to get our county archaeologist out there. That is the remnant of an ancient Indian Native American shell midden, a kitchen midden, which is where people would uh, dispose of oyster shells and all of the other material that was uh, thrown out when you're eating. And it was probably 10, 20 feet tall a thousand years ago. And over time, the rain has washed out the calcium because rainwater is a little bit acidic. And it's still today about six feet above sea level. The rest of the islands are mostly near sea level and mangrove dominated. Next. Again, focus on the patch and the history of it. This, these islands have been essentially untouched since long before the pioneers arrived. And uh, sea level rise, uh, sea level has risen and dropped minor amounts over the last, say, thousand years. Um, certainly it was all underwater 5,000 years ago because the Everglades uh, basically was all marine sediment. And then sea level started to drop and these islands became exposed and the lake filled with fresh water. Next. That fresh water is really clearly proven with this photograph around 1900. Water lilies, Nymphaea odorata, does not grow in salt water. And although the inlet was cut in 1889, there was enough pressure from the high, high water table inland that the lake was still dominantly, primarily fresh water. Maybe a little bit of brackish water near the inlet, and um, grasses and sedges grew along the edges. The island was probably, my guess, because we don't have a lot of evidence, willows, uh, grasses, sedges, maybe button bush, typical freshwater shrub vegetation. But the hammock would have had coastal maritime hammock trees. Next. This was a surprise, which I found at the Palm Beach Historical Society. The first owner of the land was, were the Potter brothers who came up from Miami. And George Potter was a, a, an accomplished sketch artist with a pencil. What you're looking at is Bingham Island, then called Pelican Island, sketched in, I think it was 1888, and really well done. You know what sable ponds are. You can see low vegetation and some shrubby trees, again, perhaps willow. 
Next. Next. Fast forward. 2016, 2017. You went too far. Back one. Well, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> okay. That's how we found the island in 2016 or 17 when the uh, Palm Beach County was working, trying to work with it. And surprisingly, Audubon, Florida discovered that they actually had a 99 year lease and not much had been done. The sable palms popping up on the right mark the hammock. Next slide. The entire island was infested with seaside meho, the Specia populnea, a terrible, fast growing, invasive coastal plant from Asia. And it has no credit, no herbivores here, no controls whatsoever. The seed pods float, all the seeds germinate, and they grow rapidly. This is comparable to Australian pine, Brazilian pepper, carrot wood, and a hundred others, which we also had on the island. So what do we do with a site that is intact and we want to remove the invasives? Well, we go at it with uh, mechanical harvesting, which we did as much as possible. People worked very hard cutting and carrying out wood. We had a machine as brought in as far as we could. The rest was treated on site with a basal uh, herbicide it's applied to the bark and it kills only the tree you're killing, you're, you're are targeting. This is the result after two weeks, yellowing of the mayho trees and what I call release. The adjacent trees now can get light and air and actually Next. Red mangrove, black mangrove, white mangrove, and buttonwood are the dominant trees on these islands. Red mangrove is probably most important. It grows in the deepest water. It has these beautiful prop roots to which oysters attach. The islands are surrounded by a rock spine, a part of a rock spine that probably has saved them. As you approach these islands, even in a shallow draft boat, you will scrape bottom and find it very hard to land, fortunately. This is sharp limestone and oyster shells. And it's an ideal foraging site for shorebirds. Um, I walk it every Sunday. There are, out, there are all sorts of native algaes, red algae, green algae, um, brown algae. There are uh, hermit crabs, there are mangrove crabs, there are limpets, there are uh, snails in the mangroves, everything that is a feast for shoreline birds. And it's also a breeding site for marine life uh, fisheries for, for young fish and so on. Next. 1878, here's the shoreline on Palm Beach Island looking west. The dominant trees are our state tree, sable palm, sable palmetto, mastic tree, sideroxylon. You may have never seen a mastic tree in your life because they seem to have all been cut down. Why? I don't know. It's a very, very strong tree. They have survived the worst hurricanes. The champion tree in Florida in Homestead went through Hurricane Andrew and at 60 plus feet tall, I think it lost about five feet off the top. Everything else was down to six feet. So the people are sitting where there would have been shrubs. I'm sorry, the mastic tree is the one to the left. It's hard to see in this old photo, but you'll see more of it uh, later on. Next. The Binghams bought the Potter Estate in 1893. And by that time, coconuts were being planted everywhere. People were clearing land for their new homes. Uh, but you can see the edge of Palm Beach Island was a rocky surface. It's a barrier island, but it is more or less stable. 
there was sand and humus on it, and it was farmed for a very long time by pre-Columbian people and by settlers, early settlers. This, of course, was uh, not landscapy enough, so you can see a coconut planted right to the right of the people. And gradually, I think um, a lot of the other vegetation was simply removed, unfortunately. Next. So the family, Bingham Blossom and Bolton all combined, had conservation in mind. And in 19, before 1942 had already started some kind of uh, agreement with uh, managing the lands as a bird sanctuary, but it was formalized in 1942 and it was leased to National Audubon Society for 99 years and the wording specifically to post and maintain the premises hereby leased as a wildlife sanctuary. So signs were put up when the causeway was built, which was not until the 1940s, fencing was put in because then it, you had a land bridge from the land directly into Bingham, the largest of the Bingham Islands, the main island. And the fence over time was breached. People did go in, mostly I think to fish along the shoreline. Um, I'm sure they had parties. I'm sure young people went in there. I don't know. But another thing happened. Invasive species, which we never talked about or weren't talked about much in 1942, were gradually, very quietly invading. And unfortunately, many of these were planted as ornamentals in Palm Beach and elsewhere. They seeded, the seed pods released seeds, Australian pine seeds still rained down on all of us from mature trees. Brazilian pepper, fruits everywhere is being carried by birds. Carrot wood is popping up everywhere and has been for quite a while. And the mayho is floating in on the currents. Next. So the islands are still carrying really healthy mangrove communities. But the hammock in the center was a surprise. I've worked with tropical hammock trees, these West Indian hardwoods for a long time. And there are very few left. Uh, the Boynton hammock has a few, uh, the uh, state park up in Singer Island, the, uh, the uh, park in Boca Raton called um, Gumbo Limbo Nature Center which is a tiny fragment of what used to stretch up and down the coast as far as Melbourne and beyond and down through the Keys. Almost all of it has been cleared. So having grown these trees and having see how, seen how slowly they grow, even in cultivation, I was shocked to see what was on this, in this one acre hammock and started to do measurements and research. So I found a paper uh, by McLaren et al, uh, 2011. They did work in Jamaica in a, an area called the Jamaican Dry Forest, very similar to our coastal um, hammock areas, our coastal woodlands, because they get about the same amount of rain. There's a uh, salt, the influence of nearby salt, it's maritime, but uh, the the ages that they came up with really good research without tree rings because these trees do not give you rings but age based on historic records in jamaica that go back 500 years next we find plants like what is commonly found as a shrub jamaica caper with a base uh, di diameter of breast height of seven inches, more like a foot at the base. In the Jamaican dry forest, 150 years. This tree in our hammock could be 150 years. Next. Black iron, the heaviest, perhaps the heaviest wood in the world. It sinks in water. 
It will not float. It's heavier than water. It sinks. It's very dense, very slow growing. Jamaican dry forest, 200 years, based on Florida measurements uh, from the Big Tree Book by Dr. Ward, about 163 years for a tree this big. Next. An interesting part of tropical trees. People in the north are familiar with a seed bank. Seeds drop to the ground, the seeds are buried, and they sit there and wait for a nice time to germinate and grow. You can't do that in the tropics. Your seeds will be eaten, fungus will destroy you, or you will simply use up your resources because it's hot and humid. So your strategy is to germinate. You make a seedling and the seedling sits and waits for a gap in the canopy. A tree falls and a lucky seedling will race to the light and get that spot. So McLaren et al. found that tropical hardwood seedlings can spend up to 43% of their lifespan at ground level. So look at a tree that's 20 feet tall in a hammock. It might have spent um, half of its life at ground level. Next. Here's the beautiful mastic tree with a buttress base. This is related to sapodilla, another very strong tree. And in the old, old Palm Beach records, this was called jungle plum. There's even a jungle plum trail with not a jungle plum, plum anywhere near it anymore. The fruits are kind of olive sized orange berries, uh, attractive to raccoons and other larger mammals, animals. I don't know that it could be bird dispersed, at least not the birds I know. And that makes you wonder how it got here from the Caribbean. It may be a pre-Columbian introduction, but it is known from the south shore of Lake Okeechobee. It's known up into Vero Beach, down to the Keys, a magnificent, beautiful, evergreen center of the hammock tree, like a live oak would be farther north. This is the core of the hammock. Next, strangler fig, another excellent, fast growing native tree that uh, provides wonderful figs for our birds and is not hurricane damaged like the uh, banyan trees, the non-native banyan ficus species. They grow rapidly, they can tip over, they have plenty of aerial roots, they will regrow and are essentially immortal. But in the background, a little blurred, probably because it was, um, growing through the ficus, the strangler fig, is a sable palm. Those are extremely remarkable trees. Up to 59 years before it was a trunk in coastal areas, according to uh, McPherson and Williams. Uh, there's another paper out by uh, a researcher from New College and um, he has found trees in Florida that are documented to be about 200 years old. In Jamaica, I'm sorry, in Bermuda, there are trees that are documented to be close to 300 years old because people notch them to uh, climb up and find uh, oncoming, look for oncoming ships. Anyway, this is a remarkable tree. It provides berries, it provides pollen, it provides nectar. It provides nesting material, fibers. It provides the boots as source, places for plants to grow in perches. It survives the worst hurricanes. If you see photos or video of Hurricane Michael in the Panhandle, while everything's blown away, the sable palms are untouched or they spring back to their original position as if nothing happened. These trees dominated the coastal islands, you are hard pressed to see any of them left, which is very unfortunate. Landscapers have called them dumpy and won't plant them or find them to be too common. And they come up with other ridiculous plantings of date palms and foxtail palms and things that have no place at all in the coastal or anywhere else in Florida. 
So our trees may be as much as 200 years old. And the ones in the original pencil sketch <laughs> could be the ones we're seeing today. Next. Gumbo Limbo. Most people know this tree. It's a beautiful tree south of Lake, of Lake Okeechobee and coastal areas up to Vero. Beautiful red peeling bark. The um, trees are male or female and the birds love the seeds or the seed coats or the insects in the tree. They uh, are great pollinate, uh, pollinator uh, attractants. They have nectar. It is an absolutely superb tree and very storm resistant. The Jamaica Dry Forest had trees they estimated to be 319 years old. Now, you, those of you who have grown Gumbo know it can grow rapidly. And that's true when it's young with good conditions. When it reaches the canopy, and in the uh, hardwood hammock, the coastal hammocks, the canopy is not that high, maybe 30 or 40 feet at most. They slow down and they go into flowering and fruiting and that's it, and continue to live. So without definite proof, I think our trees are easily two to 300 years old. Next. A few other interesting plants that have not been documented <clears throat> anywhere in Lake Worth Lagoon before. Uh, this is the golden leather fern. You're all familiar with the swamp leather fern. The golden leather fern has only the top three or four pinny, those leaf, leaflets with spores on the bottom, the brownish part. Very distinct from the regular leather fern you see under cypress. And this is adapted to coastal salt environments. There is no fresh water on this island unless it rains. And this fern is among the mangrove roots. It gets flooded with salt water. It's amazing how this fern can survive. Next. This is a really interesting plant called hoop vine, very common in parts of the Caribbean and baskets are made with it. It's a vine, a woody vine, and has never ever been found in this area before. It's uh, been found in Southwest Florida, Marco Island area. And to find this on this island, this was not brought here. This is an old specimen. And um, the person holding the branch there is Sally Channon from Palm Beach County Urm, who confirmed the identification. This is a very, very rare plant. So that tells you something about this island. There's something unique about it. Next. Here's the definition. All of you who think old growth forest is only out west or in the few uncut parts in the Northeast, wrong. It could be a small scrubby area of Florida. And this forest, as far as we can tell, was never cut or disturbed in recorded history. It rep represents a climax plant community and exhibits unique ecological features and species. This is the only one I know of in all of Palm Beach. There may be sites uh, farther south in um, Hugh Taylor Birch Park where you could, might call it uh, original and down in Everglades Park and a few parts of, uh, of Key Largo. But all these areas have been impacted by people. This little island does not seem to have ever been damaged which is really something. Next. <clears throat> so again, it sat there untouched for decades. And in 2014, um, Eric Draper, who was then with Audubon Florida and Katie Carpenter of Palm Beach made a detour because they had heard about this place and hadn't seen it. And sure enough, decided this needs attention. So I was contracted to produce a management plan. Um, I did a lot of research at Palm Beach County Historical Society. 
There is an actual document online with photos and maps, which is available. And we've been following through on the management plan. Um, I go there every week to collect trash, to document what's going on and to pull seedlings because invasive species, even after we pulled out or removed or treated, 99% of the mature plants, there are seedlings that still come back. And as some of you know, Australian pine can grow six feet in probably a month. It's astonishing, but they have to be suppressed. Palm Beach County Erm has done outstanding work in the lagoon and uh, deserves our, our thanks and accolades. They continue to do that. And um, a few private owners have done so on their property. Next. I discovered another curious thing. Um, you guys, Everglades Audubon owns four acres of probably original Potter or Bingham land directly east of the islands in Palm Beach. I was fortunate to be invited to visit by Leah Shad many, many years ago, and it was very difficult. We, we had to pull off the road on A1A, and um, all I could see were pest plants, some litter, and maybe a few mangroves. This is an opportunity. And I would urge that we look at options of what can be done to control the invasives in there and maybe make that kind of link to the uh, Audubon Islands Sanctuary. Next. I was kayaking and uh, took this shot of your parcel from the kayak looking east. Australian pines, not a good thing. They can be controlled. And I'm sure there's seaside mayho in there. And yes, it was uh, another curious fact. The original one of the interim owners was a man named Latham, who was the chief counsel to the CIA and an environmentalist. And I think that's how you guys, Audubon Everglades, got this property. But it has just sat there uh, unmanaged. Next. This is the back cover of the management plan, which is actually a printed book in short supply, but you can get it online. Next. Next to the Palm Beaches, Campion Platt, Kitty Carpenter. And I'm sorry, I've inverted Florida Audubon should be Audubon, Florida. And please support Audubon, Florida. Next. There's one more slide. There we go. Yellow crown night heron foraging among the mangroves. That's it. Thank you, Richard. Wow, that, I think that that island is to me just full of mystery. <laughs> so let's see if we can get to some questions here. All right. Okay, someone asked uh, which one is the mastic tree, but I think uh, you pointed that out. Um, <laughs> Eric Wasser mentions iguanas somewhere in the presentation. Um, I don't know, are iguanas an issue over on the islands? I have seen them there, um, but they are not an issue. They're vegetarians, mm -hmm. as far as I'm aware, and mm -hmm. my experience with them. And I've seen some burrows. I'm not concerned about them. They're common in Central America. Um, I, mm -hmm. I don't know that 
it's a major issue. We don't have vegetable gardens there. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, Mary Therese uh, Delat uh, is asking, isn't MacArthur Beach Hammock also old growth? The state park on Singer Island has, has been accessible, let's put it that way, for a very long time. I remember it as Air Force Beach. People were swarming all over the beach. I don't know the history of the wooded area. It may have been damaged, it may have been cut. There's a very interesting issue with Palm Beach. Before any pioneers settled on the shoreline, sailboats were coming down from Titusville to collect crab wood, a small hammock tree. It has very hard wood. It was collected to make pool cues, buttons, and walking sticks. Hmm. And in um, one of the really excellent historical books, they describe these sailing boats coming down, spending two weeks, cutting everything they could find filling the boats up and going back to Titusville. Mm -hmm. So that's not old growth. After they've taken all the carrot wood and anything on the shoreline was accessible to um, people coming to Florida. That's why the Keys are so badly damaged. They were easily accessible from water. And we don't know what the original Keys looked like. So mm -hmm. I, I'd hold my breath about old growth forest in Singer Island, unfortunately. It, even after a hundred years, it can grow back, but I don't know that it wasn't seriously damaged by, by people coming south. It was easily accessible. Right, right. So, and Ruthie Lynch asks, uh, is the Bingham Island group open to the public? Can we go no. birding there? No. <laughs> And as you can see from the signs, it's, or, or you'll, you'll see signs, no landing, this is a bird sanctuary. If you think about it, I was discussing lease turns with someone the other day and, and describing how they try to nest on bare sand. They don't have any place anywhere to nest because people are on every inch of bare sand or their animals are there. So they would go to rooftops, which is not good. Mm -hmm. um, we need some areas that are off limits to people. We need areas where birds have the priority. There's another issue, and that's the on the beach. It will not allow uh, that to be open as a continuously open park. That's not possible under their laws. However, Audubon, Florida will we plan to have a gate access and offer guided tours um, to people who request such. And I think all the birders will be welcome. We want to know more about it. And um, I see it also as a great opportunity for students from the local schools, mm -hmm. from FAU, from Palm Beach Atlantic, from Pine Jog. Research plots could be made where you could come back and find them after decades undisturbed. This is long-term, this is great for long-term research. Mm -hmm. Sea level rise, plant communities, and I would like to see pelicans come back. Right. Munion Island was named for pelicans in the original languages, as I understand, and every pelican was shot and they did not come back to nest. This island, Bingham, was called Pelican Island. The pioneers shot every pelican and they have not come back to, to nest. Mm -hmm. I've seen them, they are back. I don't know if they'll end up roosting again or nesting, but uh, that's the direction I'd like to go in. Mm -hmm. Give them space, leave them alone. Not every inch of the land has to be accessible to people at all times. Okay, thanks. Terry Brown has an interesting question. What do you know about the plans for Bird Island? now that the ZIF property has been sold, which included Bird Island. You conducted a tour there years ago. As you may be aware, the sandbar is overflowing with boats and people on weekends. I'm very familiar with Bird Island because I designed it. I designed the planting 
and planted it. Um, it is in private ownership. I do not know the current status. It seems to be a functioning, healthy, natural, not a restoration because that was a spoil island of pure sand covered with Australian pine. And with private funding, all the Australian pines were removed and turned into mulch. Um, we replanted with a vast majority of diversity of appropriate native plants in plant communities. That's my specialty. Got them established and it worked. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing like it. It's habitat creation. It's, it's, it's a, a, a tropical hammock, a coastal hammock. There's an edge with some sand. We tried to do a turn beach and partly because of the boaters, that was an impossibility. I don't know if we'll ever be able to do anything. I think Irm is trying to, to create turn beaches, but we have to have people understand you cannot just show up and uh, have a party at every, every little island. It's just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeanette Mitchell asks, how can we get a copy of the book or um, the, the plan about the islands that you're talking Go about? Go online to Google and type in Audubon Island Sanctuary and then ISSUU. It's a um, online publishing service. It's free and it'll be in your computer. Um, I spent a lot of work on the management plan and there's a lot to it, but uh, a lot of maps, a lot of photographs, some of them you saw in my presentation. And um, of course it was completed about three, three years ago. So not up to date, but we're, I'm keeping records of everything that's happened since. Mm -hmm. And um, Richard Linda McCandless asks, have any bird surveys been done on these islands? The one person who I know has done surveys specifically on that island is your, your, uh, uh, your member, Paul, who obviously knows what he's doing, knows the area, knows his birds. So ask mm -hmm. Paul. I did get a list from him. Um, I know there's a major list for Lake Worth Lagoon and then a sub list for uh, Bingham Island. Mm -hmm. But we need more, more volunteer, more observers. And I'll say you're all welcome to kayak around them. It's a beautiful kayaking place. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can put in on the north side of the causeway, uh, not during construction times, and, um, or get there by other means. Uh, please, no power boats, mm -hmm. just kayaks or canoes. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's another world in that lagoon and between some of the islands. It's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, helps answer the next question too, which we also touched on earlier, the Bingham Islands will be open to the public and when. Well, uh, I think you, you answered that earlier when you talked about uh, Audubon plans uh, there and um, maybe offering tours and study, and then just mentioning now the ability to kayak around the, the islands. Um, right, there's no reason to go on, on land. I mean, it's mostly mangrove. You'll see more from the water, I think, than you will on land. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I was hesitant to talk much about the hammock because it's irrepla irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had a valuable piece of art in a museum, you'd have alarms, you'd have guards. There was a beautiful ancient cypress tree up in Sanford, Florida, in a county park, protected by a three foot fence. It should have had, in my opinion, 24 hour surveillance and an armed guard around it. It's more valuable than any painting in any museum. That's how I feel about this hammock. And Unfortunately, as you know, bringing too much attention to it can also bring vandalism. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard a story recently about a, a beautiful forest of oaks in Broward County that were herbicided by vandals. Mm. I, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine why anyone would do that, but it has happened. 
So as I say, I'm hesitant to say much more. And I certainly think people should uh, observe it from a distance. Mm -hmm. um, so several people have questions about the uh, Latham property and uh, they wanted to know where it was on the map. And I remember there was a, uh, I think you had a red outline where that that's, property right. was. That's in the property appraiser's uh, um, website. Right. I don't know much about it. That's mm -hmm. your property. Right, right. <laughs> that's Everglades, Audubon Everglades. And, and also regarding that, um, uh, Mark Cook and Sabina Begg uh, are asking how valuable ecologically do you think that property is? And does it support an important hammock community? From the aerials I've seen, I don't see any hammock. Um, it drops off from my vague memory quickly. Australian pines are not going to grow in wetlands. So that would be the upland portion. I don't know. I haven't done a plant survey. Mm -hmm. The mangrove portion, any mangrove along the lake is beneficial. You are you are uh, you're filtering water. You're producing oxygen. You have habitat for oysters, for for fish, for uh, invertebrates. The entire life cycle. Mm -hmm. So any property with native trees on it has value. Great. Okay, and then back to the um, Bingham Island. Uh, Emma wants to know if you need volunteers to clean the island and help uh, remove invasives. Not, not plants. When we do invasive plants, it's with a professional company. That's how we did the first sweep. And then I go in personally and do um, removal. Some scouts have been in there under supervision and have done an excellent job removing small Australian pines. Very, very, they learn very quickly. If we do have volunteer events, they'll be announced and Mostly, I'd like to see litter picked up. Every week, I pick up bags of, of styrofoam, uh, plastic bottles, and uh, other debris. But the one I target most, as I'm sure you're aware, is fishing line, monofilament. Mm -hmm. um, it is horrible to see birds tangled. And so I'll target that. But uh, plastic, styrofoam, and then in descending order, cans. Glass is basically sand. So I'm not concerned about glass. I know people don't like broken glass, but it's not harming the, na the natural environment. I'm sorry. It's sand. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anne Wiley comments that she's really glad that it's not open to the public. And she hopes it stays that way. Great. But the iguanas need to go. They do can and eat bird eggs and they are eating the native vegetation on the island, she comments. That is a good point because iguanas will eat orchid flowers. And believe it or not, there are native orchids there. I found in Cyclia tempensis, the butterfly orchid. Historically, there would have been many different species and those have been stripped from our trees up and down the coast. The good news, Pine Jog Environmental Education Center is propagating our native orchids in the lab from seed. And they will be at some installing them throughout the property. And I don't want the orchid flowers eaten. So yes, the iguanas will have to go. And it won't be that difficult. There aren't many of them. Um, mm -hmm. If I see them, well, they're not that easy to catch, but they can be removed. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of Pine Jog, Lauren Butcher says, thank you, Richard, for sharing this important and fascinating work. Thank you as well for sharing your expertise recently for Audubon Everglades Plants for Birds project at FAU Pine Jog. <laughs> All right. Well, we've, okay. Um, we've got lots more to go here. Let's see. Um, Russell Kelly asks, when will the work set out in the management plan be complete? Well, in one sense, never, because we'll always be introducing 
uh, new orchids or orchids to return them to the wild. Um, is no structural work to be done except the continuation of a fence when they finish the Southern Boulevard Bridge. They put up a little ornamental fence, then they're going to put a chain link fence and they're going to put in their own landscaping, which I hope to have modified to our benefit. Their original landscape was not compatible. That's a nice way of putting it with the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Sanctuary is a natural area. The adjacent landscape should be appropriate native, immediately local native plants, not something from far away. But you don't want to contaminate the site. Really, the landscaping could be, as I described, an extension of the hammock of the actual Bingham Island or, or Audubon Island floristics into and surrounding the roadway. You'd be going through a national forest. It would be fantastic. We're not there yet, but yeah. we may get there. Okay. I think just let me look through a couple more here. Barbara Stewart says she really enjoyed this webinar. Thank you. Alexis Barbeau, thank you for a fascinating webinar. Um, and there's a question, can we get Richard's contact info? I think you have it online or you can put it at your, your website if you want. Um, right. I am a primarily wholesale nursery and I do consulting work. I do not do landscape design and installation. I am concerned now with conservation. Mm -hmm. And I gave a talk to the Native Plant Society last month or two months ago on our Palm Beach County Erms natural areas. There's one thing we need to do in Palm Beach County, buy all the remaining land that's not developed and put it into conservation. That's a recommendation. Yeah. We cannot get that land back again. And if we want to keep our healthy lifestyle, our, our way of life, you cannot do it without undamaged original habitat. Okay. Well, I think um, I think that that wraps it up. Then, uh, Scott, do you have? Uh, thank you, Richard. That was wonderful. It was so informative, even telling us a little bit of that of uh, that we didn't know about our own uh, Latham property. Uh, although we know we own it, uh, and we have discussed it many times at our board meetings. Uh, thank you for the invaluable information that you've given, and I'm sure we'll be consulting with you about it as we move into the future and getting your ideas. Uh, so, um, thank you. Yes, and thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I can just by the amount of questions that you received this evening, I can really see that people were interested and really enjoyed what you had to say tonight. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, Paul Davis, our presenter for next month is on. Uh, our next meeting will be Tuesday, uh, June 1st at 7 p.m. Uh, Paul Davis, uh, who's a, again a conservation biologist, will be presenting on our plastic po uh, pollution uh, problem. Uh, and some of that, as you know, is, is very local as well. It is, it's not just a problem out there, it's a problem that's here. And Paul Davis will be presenting on that subject. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, uh, thank you for your great questions for both our presenters. Uh, thank you to Rich Raphael for assisting me tonight as my co-host in the background, uh, kind of running things in the in the on the on the on the slide back there and keeping us going. Uh, thank you, Marianne, for uh, your wonderful introduction and for handling the Q&A for Richard tonight. And everybody have a safe night, have a great night. And we hope to see you again on June 1st for our next presentation. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. morning.